First of all, um, I'd like to uh, begin by saying how delighted I am to be here and to congratulate uh, Jim in particular on the launch of Maxo, but perhaps to congratulate even more the University of Southern Denmark uh, in acquiring this fabulous new center. This is a real milestone uh, and very exciting to be here at the beginning. Um, I think I was given this title by the organizers. Uh, it's an extremely ambitious title because it means talking about longevity about public policy and about healthcare needs, all in the space of 15 minutes, which I think is probably humanly impossible, uh, but let me try to do the best that I can. So, like any good story, my story begins at the beginning, uh, and this is the beginning of life. Uh, you may recognize that this is a, a beautiful image of a human egg at the moment of fertilization. Here is the sperm just on the point of beginning to start a new life. Uh, it's a reminder that we were all beautiful once. <clears throat> um, and also, it reminds me that we must uh, always pay homage to the wonderful joke that life is a sexually transmitted condition with an invariably fatal outcome. And it's this outcome <clears throat> that we're talking about here. I want uh, to just make brief reference to uh, the contribution of the extraordinarily insightful German naturalist August Weissmann uh, working in the latter half of the 19th century and early 20th century. And we're indebted to Weissmann for the really important distinction in multicellular organisms between the lineage of the germline uh, that we saw in the previous slide and the rest of the body, as it were, that Weissmann termed the soma. And what Weissmann highlighted, and one could give a whole lecture on this, but I'll have to skip over it very briefly, is that in a fundamental sense, the germline is endowed with the property of immortality. It doesn't mean, of course, that individual germ cells are immortal, but the lineage has to continue indefinitely. Uh, and this is a property that with the evolution of differentiation, our sort of evolutionary ancestors surrendered for the soma. And this has important consequences. And in fact, to go back to a point that Annetta made beautifully, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I would disagree with her in the sense that the immortality of Hydra is entirely predictable on this scheme. Because what you have in Hydra is that the germ cells permeate the entire structure of the organism. Uh, you can take any part of a Hydra, cut it up, and you will grow a new individual. And therefore, Hydra, by, almost by definition, is intrinsically immortal. Uh, and we see this in species that lack a clear germ soma distinction. So this is a part of the kind of classic understanding of this biology. What we need to do, though, is to try to think how these ideas relate to the human experience of aging. And this is a graph taking data from a typical industrialized, uh, Western, uh, westernized, developed, whatever you like to call it, nation, showing the pattern of mortality across the life course, separately for males and females. What you see, note that the mortality rate here, age-specific mortality, is plotted on a logarithmic scale so that you see that mortality is high in the early years of life for obvious reasons. It falls to its minimum in the early teens. And the extraordinary thing about looking at the data this way is that you can see that death rates rise inexorably from the early teens onwards. There's a sort of blip here, higher for males than females. This is almost entirely due to deaths from accidents, deaths from suicides. Uh, you know, we know the causes, they're tragic causes often, but take those away, and what you have is this extraordinary uniformity in the increase of the death rate, the human death rate doubling roughly for every eight additional years that we live. <clears throat> Again, there is much more in this uh, slide than I have time to unpack. One could give a whole hour lecture on what this slide is telling us, but I need to move on. Now, when we bring this to the context, we bring the evolutionary concepts to the demography of human living, <clears throat> what we can see very graphically, uh, if we take data, these uh, arrows here, although they appear rather impressionistic, are actually based on hard numbers, in this instance from the Registrar General of England and Wales. And what they show is the survivorship that would have been predicted across the life course, uh, this is age here, for a cohort born in England and Wales in the year 1900. And what you can see in the arrows below is how that was transformed over the course of just one century. And what is astonishing is to see the distribution of survival 
the change in the distribution of ages at death. And when we think about this in an evolutionary context, again, you know, echoing themes that we've heard earlier, from the point of view of natural selection, it's what happens in the yellow rectangle that's of minor, major evolutionary importance. Because, you know, for obvious reasons, just 100 years ago, but certainly in our evolutionarily ancestral past, these are the ages where, number one, you had a decent chance still to remain alive, and number two, it's when you would be making your babies. So what happens at the later ages is of minor evolutionary relevance, and it's really this that provides the context for the development of evolutionary thinking about aging, and in particular, it was this that kind of led, uh, in part, to the development of the concept of the disposable soma theory. Now, what this means, and this is where we get into the implications, is that when we look at the intrinsic biology of senescence, what we see is that aging it is not driven by any kind of genetic program, as many, many people out there imagine. Aging is driven really only, or primarily, by the accumulation of random molecular damage. And this is a lifelong process. Damage begins to accumulate from very early in the development of our lives, while we're still in the womb. And over the course of our lives, we build up cellular defects that lead over decades to age-related frailty, disability, disease. So this is, you know, the nature of the beast. And it's very important that we appreciate this. In fact, you know, it doesn't quite begin from the fertilized egg. My colleague Gabby Soretsky in Newcastle has shown that what we see is very early, about day four, five, or six of differentiation, a comprehensive down-regulation of the whole repertoire of mechanisms for cellular protection and repair. For me, that was a delightful moment because that was a fulfillment of something that I had explicitly predicted in the last paragraph of my paper in 1977, Back in Nature. And it was great to see. It's not often as a scientist. It's really so rare you get the chance to say, I told you so. <clears throat> but this was one of those rare moments. And of course, now a lot of work in our field of aging, senescence, is concerned with studying the nature of the molecular damage. So we go through the life course from one cell, we grow up, develop to be an adult of 100 million, million cells. During that process, things are going wrong in our cells all the time, even from the most basic of operations. Every time a cell divides, we have to replicate the DNA. And we know that the error rate in DNA replication is unbelievably low, about one mistake in every 10 to the 9 nucleotides copied. But of course, a human cell contains 6 times 10 to the 9 nucleotides to be copied. So that means every cell division introduces a handful of new mutations. You know, people say we live in the era of the personalized genome, and so we do. But at the same time, I can tell you, you do not have two cells in your body that have the same DNA sequence as each other. You do not have a single cell in your body today that has the same DNA sequence of the fertilized egg that began your life. So our DNA is being scrambled by the process of somatic mutation simply from errors in replication. And this is just a tiny part of the accumulation of damage. But we can measure this stuff. This shows the accumulation of mutations at a specific uh, gene locus. Uh, what we see, this is from mice. We see the accumulation in wild-type mice here. And this is uh, a strain of mice that show uh, accelerated senescence, the so-called SAM mice, senescence accelerated mice that were developed at the uh, University of Kyoto in Japan. So what we can see there is more rapid accumulation of genetic defects is associated with faster aging. Now, this isn't the occasion to go into what we're learning about the molecular changes that are associated with aging, but we now have the wonderful power of modern imaging and microscopical techniques. So this is a confocal microscope image of a senescent cell, and what you can see here is this is the cytoplasm, the sort of big uh, extensive area here, and within the cytoplasm we're using a kind of fluorescent staining for mitochondria where all you need to know to appreciate this slide is that green is bad and red is good. So if when you get older you can't, you know, hurry for the bus as fast as you could when you're younger, if your memory doesn't work quite as fast, maybe the memories are there but your neurons don't recover them as quickly, not surprising when you look at how the capacity of cells to generate energy on which all these processes depend is going to be greatly impaired. 
And if we look inside the cell nucleus here, uh, blue are DNA damaged foci on the chromosomes, pink shows us where the telomeres are located, and white shows us damage specifically at telomeres. You can visualize these things in living cells through the confocal microscope. You can watch the damage happening. You can watch some of it being repaired. You can see this process. So this gives us some kind of understanding of the underpinning cellular molecular dynamics of senescence. And what we're now on the threshold of being able to do is to be able to understand much better how cells respond to damage. And what we know is that there are two primary ways this can happen. One, they undergo apoptosis, which is where a cell detects that it's damaged and it may be dangerous for that cell to be retained within the tissue, within the organism, and the cell undergoes apoptosis to destroy the cell, remove it completely. But you don't want to destroy all aged cells, all damaged cells, because damage is happening all the cells all the time. And what we can show is that if you make a transgenic mouse more likely to undergo apoptosis in its cells when damaged, it may be better protected against things like cancer, but it ages faster because it's losing cells more rapidly. So the alternative pathway is to go into what's called replicative senescence. And over just the last two to three years, uh, in particular within the, the, the group in Newcastle in the Center for Systems Biology of Aging, we've been able to identify that entry into senescence is as tightly regulated a process as the entry into the apoptotic pathway. So we're now getting handles on understanding the regulation of these different outcomes within cells. Providing opportunities, and beautiful work was done at the Mayo Clinic a couple of years ago showing that if you clear senescent cells from mice, you can have beneficial impacts on aging. So the opportunity to intervene is quite considerable. But of course, this hasn't had an impact on the trend of increasing longevity that we've seen occurring over the last uh, years. Uh, this is a beautiful slide, much shown by people at conferences uh, from a paper by uh, the two Jims, Jim Uppen and Jim Verpel. Uh, it shows how life expectancy is continuing to increase around the world beyond what was forecast. You can see that, you know, sort of back in the 1980s, everybody was saying the increase in life expectancy was going to come to a stop. Why were they predicting that when we'd seen 200 years of increase? It's because the driver of increasing life expectancy over the first 200 years had been the reduction in death rates in the early and middle parts of life. No one had foreseen that this entirely new driver would emerge that would take over and replace the previous driver. And this is the fact that people are reaching old age in better shape than they did previously, that we have a declining death rate among older people, indicating much more plasticity, much more malleability in the aging process than was previously foreseen. And we can accommodate this malleability of the aging process with our understandings of the mechanisms that are at play. If we add to the previous diagram, so here we have molecular damage, cellular defects, frailty, disability, disease. But now we recognize that we don't live as a sort of isolated bit of biology, but we live in a real world where the body is exposed to stresses, to the consequences of adverse environments, to the consequences of poor nutrition, eating too many burgers, too many saturated fats, too many sugars, that exacerbates the accumulation of molecular damage. And on the other hand, if you follow the positive lifestyle choices, healthy lifestyle exercise, don't smoke, don't do recreational drugs, eat the right kinds of foods, fruits, vegetables, and all of that stuff, you empower the body's maintenance and repair systems in order to be able to slow the accumulation of damage. So this is really important and in terms of health implications, public policy implications, it's profound. Now, what we're seeing, everyone sees these changes in demographic profiles. These are taken from a report from the UK Office for National Statistics, but they're pretty typical, 1971, 2031 here. We've had nearly 200 years of increase in longevity. Um, I found that uh, about 10 years ago, I started to tell people that, you know, we all know that life expectancy is increasing by two to three years per decade. You know, and people shrug and say, yeah, 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 we know that. And I say, but do you realize that putting it at the most conservative, that means that life expectancy in the UK or wherever is increasing by five hours a day. That's when they stop and take notice. I've done this with two UK prime ministers and several secretaries of state. 
And always at that point, they reach into their jacket pocket, take out their pen, and write it down. Because somehow it seems to make an impact. And this is something that we really need to carry forward. Now, if you go back just to this graph, you'll see that, interestingly, uh, these population pyramids here are truncated at age 85. And the reason for this is that basically people have not tried to look at what happens in the oldest old within our population because it's actually quite hard to include them within research studies. So we motivated by uh, Rudy Westendorp's uh, colleagues in, uh, uh, and his colleagues in Leiden uh, who had been studying the 85 plus population. We launched the Newcastle 85 plus study um, some eight years ago. Nine? No, seven years ago now. Um, uh, and this is a, a study which is recruiting 85-year-olds and following them prospectively. Now, I've been given a, a, a wave from the chairman, so I'm going to have to speed rapidly through this. But what we did was to go out and to recruit from all of the people born in Newcastle, North Tyneside, uh, in uh, 1921, and recruit, managed a very high level of recruitment. And what we can see when we study what these people are like, and this is where the health implications, the public policy implications come in, is that interestingly, out of the 1,042 people in the study, we were able, because we could access their medical records as well, we ran a whole road of, load of diagnostic tests, we could determine for each individual whether they had or did not have each of 18 different age-related diseases. So everybody got a disease count. And what we found was that nobody, nobody, had nothing wrong with them. And 75% of people in this age group had four or more diseases. So multimorbidity is absolutely the norm uh, and is associated with increasing longevity. Nevertheless, and this is the positive side of this story, 78% of them, that's nearly four out of every five, self-rated their health as being good, very good, or excellent, which shows that these are chronic conditions that are on the whole pretty well managed. What we need, though, now, and this is a really important implication in terms of understanding uh, the sources that contribute to the kind of heterogeneity that we've heard about from Hal, Hal and uh, Aneta, is that you know, there are stochastic mechanisms that drive aging that lead to the final outcomes in age-related disease, but the multimorbidity comes from the fact that there are common pathways that contribute to multiple age-related diseases. So the major thrust of research now is to connect what the, as it were, the, the population studies are telling us with the pathogenesis of disease. Uh, we need to recognize that we have a large number of older people who are showing uh, considerable frailty. Not everyone, of course, but in the Newcastle 85 plus study overall, 22% of people would be de defined as clinically frail. Nevertheless, and this is again where the heterogeneity that Hal was mentioning comes in, when we assess for each individual, we look, in addition to diseases, we look at their capacity to perform activities of daily living, 17 different activities. So again, each individual gets a score between 0 and 17. What we find is that, interestingly, 30%, nearly 30% of the men can do it all. They have no functional limitation at all. Only half that number of women can do it, which touches on another really important issue in the biodemography of aging and longevity, what's known as the disability survival paradox, why it is that women who live longer on average by five to six years show more disability and disease in their longer lives. So these are great challenges. These are the, some of the participants shown here at 89 years old. I want just, uh, in drawing things to a close, a few years ago I was involved in a big study for our UK Government Office for Science, a foresight project on mental capital and well-being. I led a project on mental capital through life. And what we did was to sort of conceptualize this as having a, a trajectory of mental capital. You acquire mental capital as you grow and learn. Uh, you retain it through adulthood, and then it declines with aging. What we were able to do, this was very much a science-based review, and because we had extensive resource to commission state-of-the-art reviews from world leaders around the world, we were able to develop conceptual diagrams that show how this trajectory can be influenced by a whole host of things. And we were working with a Belgian company that loved this kind of graphic. If you go to the report, there was a paper published in Nature in 2008, but the report is available on the web. It gets more and more detailed, but it gets more and more tractable because you can get to the nitty-gritty. 
So, um, very briefly, in terms of public health policy implications, there are huge barriers, and hopefully this centre will help us to unpick some of these. You know, a lot of people don't like to think about longevity and ageing. A lot of people are just not that interested and therefore ignorant. A lot of people are stupidly fatalistic about it and imagine it can't change. A lot of people have ageism pervading what they're thinking. A lot of people show a disproportionate bias towards the young, uh, tunnel vision, failure to engage, short-termism. All of these are major problems that we confront. So uh, uh, this is just to thank the, the many people who have contributed to the development of the centre here in Newcastle. We have a, a very large and developing campus for ageing and vitality, uh, which is uh, it's, it's, it's about 10 hectares, uh, and it's filling up rapidly now with buildings, and we are delighted to continue and expand our collaborations uh, with the University of Southern Denmark and other groups, uh, and leave you with this final slide. And this is the way I like to present this. Life expectancy is increasing by five hours a day, so remember this, when you get out of bed in the morning, you are waking up not to a 24-hour day, but to a 29-hour day. Probably a 30-hour day, but 29 hours is what I'll stick with. You're gonna use 24 hours now, but each day, you're putting another five hours on your accumulated stockpile for the future. So you really need to worry about how good they're gonna be and you need to try your damnedest to make them as good as they possibly can be. Thank you. Sorry.